Okay, so uh, in science, we need to understand our, the natural world and that has, uh, we come up with statements declaring our understanding of the natural world and that is what we call a theory. So this lecture is about understanding the theory of the theory in science. Okay, so we are going to talk about what science is and the whole idea of what is real and what is factual. The scientific method, we'll just go through this quite fast because I think you're quite familiar with it. Uh, what is the aim of science and the importance of theories and some relevant issues to this whole interesting topic on, on understanding science is, what science is. Okay, I think we have to come up with uh, an uh, agreed, uh, at least a definition of science. There's so many definitions uh, depending on your textbook. <laughs> Each textbook would have its own, but more or less they understand uh, the same concept. However, uh, I found a nice definition. This is from the British Science Council, which is involved in science education in the United Kingdom. And they, and the members of the British Science Council proposed this, science is the pursuit of knowledge and understanding of the natural and social world following a systematic methodology based on evidence. Okay, now uh, the important points here is that we're no longer splitting the natural and social world. It's we're trying to understand the natural and social world as one continuum. So I think for now we still have these uh, arbitrary uh, divisions between the natural sciences and the social sciences. The, the current trend now is to look at these things in continuum. So science is not just looking at, at plants and animals, okay, or the abiotic parts of our environment, but also looking at the human world. The key points here are the four terms here. Uh, knowledge, okay, it's because it's a way of gaining knowledge. Understanding, it's a way of understanding that knowledge that you have gained, but that is based on systematic methodology and it requires evidence. So the first two, two words refer to what we call as uh, epistemology in philosophy, which is the, the branch of philosophy that deals or, or, under, or looks into how knowledge is acquired and how knowledge is understood. And the last two words here, uh, systematic methodology and the evidence is actually the process part of doing science. Now, science is empirical, which we mean by it is knowledge acquired by means of observation or experimentation. And it's only, we only get it from observable evidence, right? which allows us to justify whether an event is true or false. So we can only get knowledge in science by means of observation or experimentation and we get it from the evidence that we have observed, which allows us to justify whether it happened or not, okay, true or false. So that is what is meant by empirical. Now, at this point, uh, we need to get an introduction to the cognition of a scientific fact. Now, scientific facts, Let's say if you do an experiment, then you are trying to understand what you're observing and you're trying to, to cognize it, okay? to know it. Now, this cognition could be individually, of course, as a, so, as a society or a group of people. Okay, this political cartoon, uh, which I showed you, which is actually from one of the critics of the IATF, okay? a doctor who's involved in, uh, who's also a cartoonist, okay? uh, 
it's political because it's criticizing certain doctors with the IATF. Okay. And it really tells us this whole idea of cognition. Okay. For the doctor that is being lampooned, perhaps you would know who that doctor is. I'm not going to mention the name, no. But uh, for him, the flood is pretty much over as, as, as on an individual level. The, the flood is actually the number of cases of, uh, of COVID-19 in the country. Because, uh, because the, he is in the, what we call a life, uh, uh, life saver, okay, or salvavida in our language. No? So he could cognize that we are really over the, the number of cases in the pandemic while other people are drowning. So this is an example of cognition, no? Uh, your cognition may be, uh, may be conditioned by the, some of the circumstances that you have, which other people don't have. Now, that is also a very important thing in, in coming up with scientific facts, which, which we will get to in a little while. Okay, this is a, a, a meme in the internet, quite famous, and it's about, uh, it's a tourist attraction in some town in Canada. Okay. As you can see, you have the, the stone here, and you're supposed to uh, observe the stone, and if the stone is wet, then it's raining. <laughs> if it's dry, it's not raining. If there's a shadow on the ground, it's sunny, and so on, okay? And if the stone is jumping out and up and down, there's an earthquake, and if the stone is gone a tornado took it away okay. now uh we are observing what's on the stone supposedly okay and that's empirical now what is this forecast here okay this is your construction of a fact based on what you observe on the stone so this is a, a tourist attraction that's uh, considered to be a gag you know? But actually, it's a demonstration of the importance of observing and coming up with a construction of what the fact is. So if you, saw, if, you, if you see that the stone is wet, then you're constructing the fact that it might be raining. And you would not know if it's raining or the sun is shining if you do not observe. Now, of course, uh, a stone on uh, on hanging from a tourist attraction in Canada is uh, is easily observable. But if you are doing some science that is uh, more outer space, <laughs> in outer space, uh, for instance, uh, about uh, a few years ago, uh, some scientists concluded that there's a diamond planet in a in another in another star system about 32 light years away from us, okay? Now, uh, they were able to conclude that the diamond planet is, uh, the planet is made of diamond because they found out that it's likely to be made up of pure carbon. So the question is, is the diamond planet based on empirical evidence? Okay, uh, the thing is, we can only observe it through, uh, I think it was observed through the Kepler telescope, no? uh, which is a telescope orbiting around the Earth. No? So it's not really a direct observation, but it's inferred. Okay? The existence of the planet is inferred from the wobbling of the stars the star starlight, okay, because the planet is blocking the star's light, so we can identify that there must be a planet that's orbiting around that star. And based on the wobbling of the, the star, uh, it's, a, it's possible to compute the mass of the planet. And from the reflected spectral qualities of the light coming from the star, they were able, and also the planet, the, they were able to conclude that the planet is based on carbon. Without them, the astronomers directly observing the planet. Okay. So it is inferred from other properties that we know 
and based on scientific theory, well established that the planet is made up of carbon. And we know from geology that carbon under high pressures can turn into diamond. <laughs> so this is the famous bling planet. Okay. Is it based on empirical evidence? Uh, we did not see it directly, but we were able to infer its existence and its quality or its properties based on the scientific theories we know on Earth. We can posit the existence of something based on the behavior of other, of other events or objects that are related to it. Okay, that's, that is uh, one of the lines in a science, science fiction movie. Okay. So uh, here we did not observe it directly, unlike the stone that, we sh that I showed you earlier, but we can infer the nature of the planet from other scientific theories that are related to it. Now, uh, a later example, a more recent example from, the, from a year ago is the possibility of there are microbes on Venus because there's phosphine gas detected on Venus atmosphere. Now, uh, phosphine gas on planet Earth is almost always produced by microorganisms. So if you have that on in the atmosphere of Venus, then can we say that there might be an, there might be a microbes floating on the atmosphere in the atmosphere of Venus? based on the scientific theory that we have on Earth? Okay, that is a big question because it's possible for us to directly observe Venus by sending a, a space probe there, okay? And I think that's one of the things that they want to do when they send the next space probe to, to Venus to determine if there is really, if there are really microbes floating in the atmosphere of Venus. And you know that Venus is just extremely hot, right? Uh, Russian space probes have gone to the surface of Venus and they recorded the temperature more than 600 degrees Celsius on the ground of the planet. So any, any bacteria as we know it on Earth probably won't survive. Okay, so uh, given those two examples, uh, I think uh, we can say that some of the scientists uh, did some induction in which we start with a series of individual observations and try to come up with a general conclusion or statement. And that's exactly what happened in the Diamond Planet case because uh, we know from several theories in science, especially the how we can identify the elements based on the light that's being reflected from them. Okay? That is induction because we can easily do that from Earth, from different uh, events on Earth. No? Then we, the scientists did the deduction in which they start with one general statement and predict the specific conclusions if the statement were true. So what did they do? They observe other possible planets in the Kepler system and they found out some of the planets are not reflecting the same quality of light as compared to the one, the diamond planet. So it's only the diamond planet is probably made of carbon. Uh, so that's deduction. Uh, induction is used to, to come up with the so-called scientific question and deduction is used to come up with the conclusions. Deductions are usually done when you are doing experiments in your scientific research. Now, of course, uh, scientists are also concerned about reality. Now, the thing about reality, it's a metaphysical concept. It's not really studied in the sciences. Okay. It's a metaphysical, metaphysical concept beyond the scope of, of science, however, uh, we need to know that it consists of things in themselves which we cannot hope to gain knowledge about. Or to put it more clearly, we cannot know everything about something. <laughs> and in science, we can only content ourselves with the knowledge of things that we can observe. And that is what we call empirical reality. Because these things could be measured. If you can observe an event, then you can measure it. And so in the diamond planet case, they can easily measure the spectral quality of the type of the planet 
that is supposedly made of carbon okay, from the light that comes from 32 light years away. Now, scientists think that real things are objectively existing independent of perception or measurement. If you're able to measure and perceive it, then in science, we think that that object is existing independently of our own perception. So our minds are not just making it up. <laughs> it really exists. And reality is rational, predictable, and accessible to human reason. Important thing here is human reason. For science, in order to know what is real, then you have to use your human reason. Now, if we talk about real things, then we might, uh, might as well talk about what is really, what is true. Okay, what is truth? Okay. Now, this is another philosophical question that's beyond our scope, but it's good for us to reflect on it for now. It's the most famous question in the Bible. <laughs> So if you read your Bible, okay, uh, one of the most, the most famous questions there was uh, asked by Pontius Pilate to Jesus Christ. And you can read it in John 18, 38. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And Jesus did not answer directly. Maybe it's an important, uh, important teaching moment for anybody who reads the Bible. No? Uh, the Bible doesn't tell you what is true. You have to understand the Bible for what it is. <laughs> okay, so just like science, no? Uh, in, in science, science will not tell you if something is real or, or true. You have to find it out for yourself. Okay, even Galileo to his students said that uh, truth is... Uh, Truth is easily understood if someone tells it to you. But the point is we have to find out for ourselves because that doesn't really happen all the time. No? Uh, truth is to, we have to find it out for ourselves. Okay? Now, there is a, a nice uh, sound bite from the Indiana Jones movies, and I'll play it to you in a while uh, here. Theology is the search for fact, not truth. It's true if you're interested in Dr. Tyree's philosophy classes right down the hall. So forget any ideas you got about lost cities, exotic travel, and digging up the world. We do not follow maps to bury treasure, and X never, ever marks the spot. Okay, so this is from the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade movie, which uh, among the series is my favorite. <laughs> now, because uh, yeah, because of the the plot and also the I think um, Harrison Ford was already more mature in the role when he when he played the role of Indiana Jones there. Okay. Now, archaeology is a science, so. In this important sound, this interesting sound bite here, Ar archaeology deals with facts, okay? And if you want to study truth, you better attend a philosophy class. <laughs> so now we can get to the idea of what is a fact. Uh, a fact is something that exists, okay? That is the basic definition. It's from the Latin factum, or made by someone or something that became. Again, let's go back to the Bible. Okay, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, in the Gospel, in the Gospel of St. John, it's in the first verse of the first chapter. First chapter. Uh, in Latin, it says, et verbum, et verbum caro factum est. And the word became flesh, <laughs> which is part of the Christian uh, liturgical prayers, which you can hear in church if you attend your church services, if you're a Christian, you'd probably have heard of this. Now, why is that so? <laughs> okay, before we get into that, just a, a segue, no? segue to that. No? Uh, 
Christianity as a religion, and we will soon find out later on, uh, Christianity as a religion is uh, emphasizes that Jesus Christ became a real human being, which is quite a new, uh, different from the religions before, okay? in which the gods were in heaven and they never came down to earth. In, 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 in physical form. Uh, Christianity, the core of Christian belief is God became a human being. So if, it became, if God became a human being, then your God would have become a fact. And for Christians, they believe Jesus Christ is God. And the fact is Jesus Christ really existed. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jesus Christ was not just mentioned in the religious writings, but also in secular writings of historians of that period. Now, now whether Jesus Christ is God or not, or the Messiah or not, uh, that is something beyond history and also beyond science. Okay? But the point I'm making is the Christians insisted that Jesus Christ became a fact, a human being. And that has a lot of uh, a lot of relevance to understanding why science, the way as we know it now, developed in mid, in Christian and medieval Europe. Okay, the systematization happened in Christian and medieval Europe, more more specifically Catholic Europe, because there were no Protestants then, no, in the medieval ages. So uh, we'll get back to that later on once when, when we. Uh, look at the history of science in the medieval period in Europe and also in comparing it with the history of science in China. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the scientific method. Okay, um, the scientific method is about observation, uh, formulating a problem, and proposing a hypothesis. Okay, these are the first three steps. No? Uh, the problem is what we call the scientific question or scientific problem yeah, because the problem is best expressed as a question. Now, the answer to your scientific question, the tentative answer is the hypothesis. So it's the hypothesis that you want to test. And the only way to do that is to, to collect your data okay, by experimentation or testing or comparative observations. Then you analyze the results. Then you state the conclusion and you write the results and you report them. So I don't want to dwell on this because you are familiar with this from your, from since grade school. Right? Now, this is something that probably your grade school science teacher did not really, most likely he or she did not uh, tell you this No. The only reason why we have the scientific method is to get our facts right, okay? It's not to find the truth, okay? It's not, it's not for you to gain a new dimension to your, your inner life, okay? It's just to get the facts right, okay? That's it. So that leads us to the fact principle. Uh, in science, we, come up with scientific facts because we have reference to a scientific theory. So the main objective of science is to form a theory which is nothing but an explanation of a natural phenomenon. And the theory is a hypothesis that has been repeatedly tested and found to be likely true. And a scientific law tends to have a integrative and more holistic explanation of several theories that are related to each other. Prime example for that is the theory of universal gravitation by Newton. It explains a lot about classical mechanics, okay? okay but we won't get into that, no? Uh, the important point here is science just aims to form a theory or that's the goal of science, really. And so the theory, it will be good if it's empirical, it's objective, it's repeatable, predictable, <laughs> and if you can falsify the theory, falsifiable. Because scientific conclusions can be changed with new observations. 
Now, uh, being being repeatable, of course, uh, one of the important the important characteristic of science is you should be able to do the experiment again or the research again and come up with similar conclusions, which means you repeated the the results. Okay? Uh, repeatability is a major criterion criterion to to know if a scientific conclusion is really scientific or not. Anyway, so let's look at famous theories. Uh, I, I don't want to go into this quite. We'll go to this quite fast because this is our famous theories like evolution, uh, the theory of inheritance by Mendel, the cell theory, every living organism is made of cells, okay? continental drift, special relativity of Einstein, of course, the famous heliocentric theory of Copernicus. Now, the thing about facts is this, our knowledge and understanding of reality in the empirical sense are founded on verified scientific facts, which was derived from careful observation and experiment. But the facts themselves are not theory neutral. Observation and experiment are not possible without reference to a supporting theory. Science is built on previous theories. Uh, we are we are getting a better understanding of the natural world by adding more knowledge to a previous theory. Okay, so that's how it is, no? Now, uh, of course, you have a theory, you know your facts, okay? How can you make sure that your facts could be repeated? <laughs> by other researchers, then we need to come into the idea of an abstraction, okay, of a theory, okay. Now, uh, in science, we abstract, we make the theory of abstract by using mathematics. Now, why is that so, no? Okay, theories in science are constructed to represent empirical, empirical facts about reality. And in order for us to be more exact, we need to express it as a mathematical concept. And the process of abstraction to facts is rather, is rather complex. The abstraction of facts to theories is complex. It's creative, intuitive, and is an art. Okay. We'll get to that in a little while. Why is it like an art? Okay, one of the interesting examples that have come out in the last decade is a group of statistical physicists and mathematical statisticians came, uh, did a research by looking at the best way to tie a ponytail. <laughs> Okay, um, this came out in 2012, okay? Now the question is why would, why would someone on earth try to mathematically model the best way to tie your hair, okay? Uh, for people with have no hair like me, uh, this is totally beyond my experience. No? But, but for some people who are blessed with hair, okay? Perhaps they have to do this every day. Uh, tie their hair in a ponytail. No? Question is, why would anyone try to explain it in a mathematical way? Okay. Now, if you read the paper, since I am not a statistical uh, physicist or a mathematical statistician, even though I studied statistics, though, I, I, by training, I am uh, an ecologist. No? So sometimes the, if I, I read it and a lot of the concepts are totally strange to me, I can recognize some of the functions that were written in the paper like this, no? the one that describes the perfect ponytail. Uh, this is essentially a probability distribution right? based on the statistics that I studied. No? Now that's not the point there, okay. These integrals here, that's not really the point there. But the, the point here is the, the writers of the scientific paper express the reasons for, for studying the best way to tie the ponytail. It's to solve the enchanting problem of ponytails. <laughs> it really enchanted them, okay? And if you're an artist, there must be something that you are looking in your world that may enchant you 
to create something. So, uh, this is a teaser for the arts and science uh, module. No? What makes scientists do art? Okay. Uh, perhaps they are enchanted. In this case, the mathematicians were enchanted with the perfect ponytail. Now, the thing with the ponytail is this, okay, uh, when they wrote the paper, they did not really envision a technological application, but some engineers found out that their equations could be used to make uh, better fiber optic uh, bundles for better and faster internet communication. So there is an application in, in technology. Okay, then, of course, the, the theory, whether enchanting or not, should be tested. <laughs> So the theory should be testable, verifiable, and falsifiable. Now, which means you have to do your experiments again, okay? And you may come up with several hypotheses. Now, the English uh, Franciscan priest who lived in the Middle Ages, William of Ockham, came up with what we know now as the Ockham's razor. And in Latin, it's pluralitas non esponenda sine necessitate, ceteris paribus. Uh, this means only one thing. Okay. Now, ceteris paribus is in the English language now. What does that mean? Translating it literally from the Latin, pluralities ought not to be supposed without necessity, everything else being equal, which is ceteris paribus. Okay. But in more modern English, we say, given two equally predictive theories, choose the simpler one, or, or of two equivalent theories or explanations, other, all other things being equal, the simpler one is to be preferred. Okay, the formal term for Occam's razor is the principle of parsimony. When we're evaluating scientific theories, you can have several theories for a, for a phenomenon, then the simpler one is the one that's most likely to be true. Simpler theories are easier to falsify. Now, all scientific theories or conclusions can be falsified, and you can do that if you have better data. And so you have to state in advance what experimental observations will disprove your hypothesis. And if such findings do emerge, just accept that the hypothesis was wrong. Okay? Don't take your scientific conclusions too personally. Uh, the job of science is to falsify conclusions okay? <laughs> with better data. And that's exactly how science would advance. No? Uh, the point is all scientific theories can be falsified, even the theory of gravity <laughs> or even the heliocentric theory could be falsified, but the chances of falsifying the heliocentric theory is just too small. Okay, so now we come to the testability principle that all theories should be testable and it should be objective, which means it's empirical. And the test would show if the theory is true or false. And we can do that because there's a mathematical way of stating your theory. And if the theory is found false, it may not be completely wrong. It may be just your assumptions were wrong. So you come back, do research again, correct your assumption and come up with a better theory. And that's exactly what scientists do. They keep on repeating their experiments to make sure that they are more or less right and they can come up with facts that are less likely to be falsified and so we come to the whole big problem here which is in Bagot's paper okay uh, the correspondence and veracity principle does the theory really corresponds with reality as you observe it now science there's something called scientific truth which means it's a scientific fact that has been verified for so many times that we might as well accept it as true. Example, the heliocentric theory. Okay? Anybody who has seen pictures of space would see that the Earth is orbiting around the sun. Okay? Now, uh, science finds facts not by proof as in mathematics but by falsifying them and the hypotheses that are validated many times are scientifically true so the heliocentric is one of them no 
Now, no matter how many times the hypothesis survives, it can never be completely true. Even the heliocentric theory could be wrong. But the chance of being wrong is quite very, very small. In fact, I can't even think of a reasonable reasonable counter explanation to the heliocentric theory. Maybe you can, okay? Now, the veracity principle would state that the scientific theory cannot be absolutely true. It should be simple according to the Occam's razor principle. <laughs> and if the theory survives many tests, then we can consider it scientifically true. Now, the important thing here is, and this is very important in the debate on science and culture today, a scientifically true theory has what we call truth likeness. Okay? I am quite annoyed by people saying that science is the truth. No, that's, a, that's really totally what I call hogwash. No? Because science can be wrong. <laughs> Remember, it has to be there is a chance for it to be falsified and we come up with better conclusions. No? But uh, a scientifically true theory, which uh, established by rigorous research, okay, rigorous methods, and uh, also a careful uh, assessment of the assumptions of your scientific question, whatever conclusion would come from that has truth likeness, which means it could represent as much as the scientific method would allow, what is truly real in the natural world. So going to the whole problem of vaccination, no? uh, a lot of scientists claim it has really great truth likeness, okay? but a lot of people deny the truth likeness of vaccination. So uh, I think we should reflect on that because that is a major issue to this at this present moment, no, uh, the whole question of vaccination. So we come to come to the Copernican principle. What is the meaning of our place in the universe? Right? Science being any endeavor to know something about the world or the universe. That's a cliche. Right? Uh, of course, as human beings, uh, we have to reflect on why are we doing this? Now, science can actually, in a way, allow us to do that. No? What is our place in the universe? It's attributed to Copernicus. Okay? Because Copernicus is the one that really uncentered the sun, okay? in, in metaphorical terms. Because before that, uh, people thought that the earth was the center of the universe no but copernicus says that the data doesn't the data says otherwise so copernicus is one of the famous sound bites and quotes from copernicus is those things which i am saying now may be obscure and yet will be made clearer in their proper place so look at the painting here <laughs> Uh, okay, this was done in the 19th century. No? But even then, this is, again, just to point out the importance of in, in modern science where it really arose in Europe. Right? Just to point out some important cultural meme here. Okay? Western Europe was much influenced by the Romans, definitely, and the Greeks. And when the Roman, the Roman uh, knowledge and traditions were taken over by the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, the Roman Catholic Church actually borrowed a lot of those ideas. Okay, uh, from from ancient Rome. And the Catholic Church was the main cultural influence in the Middle Ages until the Renaissance and even a little bit beyond. So in art. When you discover something scientific like Copernicus, look at the look at the expression of Copernicus here. It's as if he was receiving a revelation from God. But that's not scientific, that's religious. Okay? If, but if you look, how did he get that revelation or knowledge? It's not from God or an angel or a saint, but from the scientific 
tools that you would find around him. The model of the universe here, of the solar system, and the things that he used to observe the stars. And Copernicus really was part of the cathedral clergy of at that time. So he was with the church. So the Copernican principle, okay, it's no longer receiving revelations from God, okay? Uh, the universe isn't organized for, for our benefit, okay? And our existence is a natural consequence of nature. Empirical reality is something we learn to observe with detachment. And scientists ask questions on how reality works and seek answers from evidence by observation and experiment. So in science, we say that we're not really that special. Uh, sometimes we will have problems with that. No? Even in, in, in biology and ecology, uh, some people will have problems with that. For example, we keep on hearing that we are the most advanced species that ever lived. <laughs> That's not the case because uh, if I send you naked to Antarctica to live with the penguins, you do not wear any protective clothing, you will die. The penguin is more, is more uh, advanced than you in that regard. <laughs> so uh, we're not really that special. Religion will tell us that we are probably special, okay? But uh, in, in science, we're not really that special. It's really just an, a natural consequence of nature or a product of Darwin's evolution. You can put it that way. Anyway, how does science advance? Okay, uh, it's due to a paradigm shift. Right? And that is in the reading on Kuhn, which, you, which is in your Uble folder. Now, what is a paradigm shift? Okay. According to the philosopher of science, uh, Thomas Kuhn, okay, science advances not due to an orderly development, but by paradigm shifts. Okay? Some scientists would come up with data that overturns widely held principles and will falsify the old principle that has been accepted for so long. But in order to do that, you need good data. And so there is this important uh, cliche in, in, in science. No? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if you think that the COVID vaccine is useless, then you have to have extraordinary evidence to say that in a scientific way, because all of the science data would say that the vaccines work. But of course, they don't work 100% uh, of the time, but most of the time they would work. So what are the examples of paradigm shifts? The, the theories that we learn in our science tech textbooks are most of them are paradigm shifts like the heliocentric theory the theory of blood circulation by dr william harvey quantum theory relativity darwinian evolution bolide theory of di dinosaur extinction in in ordinary words when the asteroid hits the earth okay it killed off all the dinosaurs that is a paradigm shift because before people attributed the extinction of dinosaurs to to changes in the Earth's climate, but uh, extraterrestrial event such as uh, asteroid is capable of doing that. And there's scientific evidence to say that that really happened. Of course, genetics by Father Mendel and global warming by the IPCC. Now, uh, global warming is a paradigm shift. Because uh, before we thought that climate changes were particularly local rather than global, but with a lot of data uh, and a consensus of a lot of scientists, then we know that climate change, climate change has really changed how we view our planet. Okay? As the heliocentric theory has changed how we view the universe. So it's a paradigm shift. No? Um, uh, about number two, this is interesting, no? Uh, okay, uh, something of the ancient and medieval idea of blood circulation 
is still retained culturally on Valentine's Day. Okay. Now, why am I saying this? Because the Greeks, the Romans, and ancient cultures believed that the heart was the seat of emotion. Okay. Now, William Harvey was able to scientifically prove that the heart has nothing to do with that, but the heart has something to do with circulating blood, especially to the lungs. Okay. So, if you're really truly empirical and objective and scientific on Valentine's Day, you should be giving your special someone not a heart-shaped card or chocolates that are shaped like hearts. You should give them red chocolates uh, shaped like a brain. Or your Valentine card should not have a heart but a brain. Because we know that the brain is really the seat of emotion. Okay, That's what uh, neuroscience will tell us. And nobody sends uh, brain-like uh, Valentine cards. Okay? So something of the old still remains today. Okay, That's what I, I just want to, to mention. Okay, But uh, sending a Valentine card that is shaped like a heart doesn't mean that you deny science, no? Because it becomes a metaphor now, okay? But uh, there are some theories that are really denied, like climate change, of course, vaccination, evolution, even the quantum universe is denied, okay? And of course, genetically modified organisms. We can talk about this later on in the semester. Okay, for your group work on, on, on the scientists in history, uh, what you have to do is to read the life of a scientist in history. Okay, what was his or her question? Okay, I'm quite ito, gender, di ako gender balance dito. What was his or her question? Uh, how did he or she do his his or her experiment within the historical context that scientists practiced his or his or her profession? And how did the theory of science was created during that time? Okay, the scientist is working on a particular field of science, uh, how did that scientist create that theory given the historical and social context of the time that he or she was living? For example, Copernicus, okay? what was the what, what, what was the, the context of the time of Copernicus? It's different, of course, than what we have now. Okay. What about Galileo? What was the context? Then it was different in Galileo's time than in the time of Copernicus. Okay. During the time of Copernicus, that was before the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church was more liberal. But after the Protestant Reformation, when Galileo came around and writing his science, the church was more less liberal. It was more threatened by a lot of political forces, so it had to silence Galileo. Now, what about today? Okay. Can our scientists still do their work quite openly? Okay. Some questions to reflect on. Now, uh, here in our country, I think the university should really raise hell about this. Diba? We have some of our academics working with this OCTA group no? uh, making forecasts about the COVID-19 pandemic and some politicians were not really amused by the predictions that were coming out from OCTA. And now they're trying to, to do all the things to shut up OCTA. The, the academics working with OCTA. Okay? So things have not really changed. No? In the past, they, the powers that be would shut up scientists because they were very empirical and factual. And that doesn't do, doesn't jibe with the politics of the, of the powers that be. Just like in the time of Galileo, what's happening now is more or less, there's nothing that really has changed except, uh, except our politicians are not priests. <laughs> So, uh, another thing to reflect on is why do really people deny science? And this is really relevant today, no? question about the vaccination. No? Why do some people want ivermectin, even though the scientific data says that ivermectin is, doesn't really work for COVID-19? Okay? And some of them 
are even doctors <laughs> promoting it. No, uh, I have a friend from Malaysia who's a doctor, and he is convinced that ivermectin works. <laughs> and I told him, well, uh, from what I have read, the scientific data is more veterinary than anything. It works for horses, uh, pigs. But not in humans. <laughs> so anyway, uh, those are things that we need to reflect on. No? Uh, the bagot reading alludes to a lot of it. Of course, the bagot reading has more, more detail on what, what I, I said right now. No? But the important thing with the bagot uh, reading is the correspondence principle, the abstractions, and the, the fact principle. Okay, So try to digest that, though. No? Now, uh, the bagot reading is quite interesting because 